Good evening, ladies and gentlemen, and a happy good evening to you wherever you are. This is the Clara Looper Radio Show, and today's show is being brought to you by Rainbow. And Rainbow is good bread. As we prepare now for the holiday season, as we prepare to celebrate once again the good news time, the following businesses would like to wish each one of you a Merry Christmas and a Happy New Year. The Roth Film Home, Temper and Son, McKay Davis Film Home, Soloway Otto, Gates Barbershop, Stales, Ruby and Jim, Mr. Carl Carbon, Petite Salon, Cashland Check Cashin, and the Exotic Plants and Floors. Wish for each one of you a Merry Christmas and a Happy Holiday. Today's program is going to be a very special program. It's a program that you, the radio audience, you have been waiting for. It's going to be exciting. And once again, as part of our newspaper and radio creed, I promise to report to you the news. If I should report any story that's incorrect, all you will have to do is to call me and I will certainly correct it. Clara Looper reporting. The NACP Youth Council is busy working to build a monument to blacks and whites that have fought and are still fighting and those that have died for freedom. We want you to help us in this endeavor. We want you to stand up to the world and say, I believe that ours been a great history. I believe that somewhere black people and white people must look at what it has been accomplished in this democracy. We need your help. When I first told you about the Black History Monument, I told you that they had a monument for seagulls in Salt Lake City, Utah, and those people are proud of their monument. I told you they had a monument for the bow weavers in Mobile, Alabama. I told you that in Acapulco they have a monument to the frog. And then I ask you if you would be willing to contribute to a monument for blacks and whites that have fought for freedom, justice, and equality. Not only did I tell you I wrote to the churches in Oklahoma City because as a student of history, I know that social changes have come about because of the black churches. And today I would like to ask again for those of you that are leaders in churches and those of you who believe that we should have a monument to blacks and whites that have fought for freedom, I would like for you to call us, 478-2103, R. Wright Freedom Center, Post Office Box 11106, Oklahoma City, Oklahoma. When our first appeal went out, I was so pleased and excited because I knew that you were going to rush and help us. I knew that you wanted to see something that you could point to. You knew that I was not going to take the negative side that we can't make it these are dark days because somewhere I read something that Charles Dickens wrote. These are the best of times. These are the worst of times. And I thought to by even looking up to the sky toward a torch, someone would be inspired to say, I have something to do. Now we have a responsibility as blacks and whites. Our responsibilities are very clear, very simple. 
Thomas Jefferson put it this way, we cannot have a democracy unless we have people that have sense enough to operate a, a democracy. And you cannot operate anything unless you know something about it. So therefore, the NACP Youth Council is leading the fight for people to know something and to see something that they can touch about what blacks and whites have done together. I've had the opportunity recently to teach a class at Rose College, at Oklahoma Christian College, and some high schools. And I would like to thank the leaders of those institutions for giving me that opportunity because once again, I've had the opportunity to look at young people and to say to young people, I'm depending upon you. We are depending upon you. Our country is depending on, upon you. We're depending upon you then to help us. We need you. We have enough drug addicts. We don't need any more. We have enough thieves. We don't need any more. They tell me that our jails are being filled, and I have seen it myself with young people who say to me, Miss Looper, I was with the gang or the people. I'm keeping up with my peers. I'm bored. And I don't buy all of that because I think each person in this country has a responsibility not only to himself but to his country. When we step out, we must be stepping out looking to people that are on their way somewhere. It might take us a long time to get where we want to go. And it might not happen in, a li in my lifetime but it will happen in yours if you will stop and see and support things that are building. Well, we are builders, and we need your help. Our telephone number is 478-2103. Clara, do you expect people to support you? No, I don't expect them to support me. I expect them to support the great cause of freedom. I expect them to support something on the east side that would give us new hope, new vision, and a new look at what we are going to do. I don't care how much people give us. You can give a penny, a nickel, a dime, a dollar, five dollars on up. It will be all right because I know you would have done your best. I would like to thank all of you that have given. Certainly, I would like to thank our Attorney General and the Corporation Commissioner senators and others that have sent contributions to this great cause. And Letty, I know you're smiling because we were able to get those tanks removed at Freedom Center. And I know you are very, very happy because those tanks, tell us about those tanks, Letty. Yes, Mrs. Looper, we had to remove those tanks according to an audience uh, that was passed out, uh, I think, a city one. So we had to find someone to come and dig up the tanks and find the location of the tanks and then remove the tanks. So this we did. And we found that we had four huge tanks and they were as tall as I am and I don't know how many feet long. But we got the tanks removed and after removing the tanks, uh, and getting the removed, he said, now wait, all of this, we could sure sell them and maybe get us some money because I'm sure someone wants to buy these tanks. And surprisingly, Ms. Looper, no one wanted to buy the tanks. We had to go buy, blow the tanks up, cut them up, and stack them up. Now, what kind of material did we have to, to <laughs> blow up a tank, cut the tank up, and those big, heavy tanks? We didn't even have a uh, shovel to dig the dirt with. So you know we didn't have heavy equipment to cut metal. So therefore, then we had to get somebody to move them off of the premises. And then we had to get someone to haul in some dirt and fill up the holes. Now you can imagine four large tanks about how much dirt it was going to take to fill the holes up. But we have them filled up and we're waiting now to get some payment put back over the uh, space. It's a big, large space. And uh, we are continuing to improve Freedom Center. So they, we are asking again your help. We want to improve the yard. We worked on the building. 
you know, the building leaks for so many, many years, and we had to pay for that. We not only did we lose the ceiling, we lost all of the floor covering that we had on the floor because we weren't able to pay for the roof, and it rained down through the roof onto the floor, on through the ceiling. So that created a big chore and a big expense for the Freedom Center. But we managed now to put a roof on, and then after we got the roof on, we managed to put, get someone to come in and repair the ceiling and the walls where the rain had seeped down beside the walls because of the leakage from the roof. Then we had to remove some carpeting that we had on the floor because the water had gotten under the carpeting, and because of the mildew, it had decayed the carpeting that we had there. So these are just some problems that we encountered, and I guess it, it may be in all households, you know about this kind of expense. And we only have children that we work with, and we ask the children, each time that you come to a Freedom Center, bring a can. Because if you do not have money, you can always pick up empty cans because someone are throwing pop aluminum cans down. So we ask the children to pick up the pop cans and bring the pop cans, and we collect the cans and we sell them. Now, we have the, our usual bills. We have the light, water, and gas. It's the same that you have in your home. And I think you do know that those bills are expensive. So for the little money that we get on uh, Monday nights, we do have a meeting each Monday night. And we have a wonderful group of young children because we have children that we are working with. And if the parents do not give them some money to help support the Freedom Center, then we must depend on our canned sales. So if you've been throwing away your cans, why don't you call us on Monday night and ask us to come and pick up your cans. That you do not have any money, but you can give us these cans. And we do not mind picking them up and taking them and selling them so that it can help with the expense that we have at the Freedom Center. So there is something that each person in the community can do. And we'll be looking forward to you calling us for cans. And if you have some donations, you may call for that. A number of you called in when we had our drive for the membership drive. You called in and you made your pledges. Now we are getting the mail out to you uh, concerning your pledges. Now I know you know that's going to cost us a little money to mail those to you. But now you remember that you made the pledge. Rather than spending us uh, another quarter to tell you you made the pledge, that would take off of the dollar that we're going to have from the membership that you gave. We'd appreciate it if you would just slip uh, the money in the envelope and send the money in to us concerning the pledge that you made. Now, some of you will be getting some, some letters, and we are trying to get them all off at some date. So at this time, I'm asking you to send your children over on Monday nights to meet with us at the NAACP Center, and that's 2609 Martin Luther King. And I'm sure they will be inspired. We have lessons, and we just do many, many things over there at the Freedom Center. So come by on Monday nights, and the meeting is at 7 o'clock. And back to Clara. Thank you, Letty. Today's program is being made possible by Marilyn Hildred, your Allstate insurance agent. You may call Marilyn at 848-7470 for all of your insurance needs. I promise you, as your favorite radio reporter, that I would bring you the best. I would supply you with the information that you needed. Many of you have called and asked me about Oklahoma State University, University's technical branch located at 900 North Portland Avenue. You have asked me about that university, and not only that, I was in Detroit, Michigan, and Dr. Piggy and others asked me about this university. I came back home and I said, what I shall do, I shall do a survey and see how much you know about the university and how much you wanted to know. And if you want to know something, you've got to go to the source of information. And certainly today, ladies and gentlemen, I have with me the Honorable President of Oklahoma State University's technical branch, the Honorable Dr. James Hooper. How are you today, Doctor? 
I'm just doing fine. How are you, Clara? I'm really happy that you're doing fine. I understand that you've been ill this week. Well, I had a few problems. Maybe a voice. If my voice will hold out, we'll be all right. Okay, well, we are going to be all right. Well, I would like to introduce you to the most intelligent radio audience in the state of Oklahoma. We are now talking from Wichita Falls, Texas, into Wichita, Kansas. Now, Dr. Hooper, we want to know about you. Where were you born? I was born in Rush Springs, Oklahoma, which is about 70 miles, uh, almost straight south of Oklahoma City, and uh, uh, grew up there uh, in Rush Springs and uh, spent a lot of my school and education years in Oklahoma. Where did, you go, where did you go to high school? I went to high school in Cement, Oklahoma. Cement, Oklahoma. That's really good. Is Cement close to Rush Springs? Yes, it is. It's about uh, 40 or 50 miles from Rush Springs, uh, southwest of Oklahoma City. Okay, now, in high school, did you graduate at the top of your class? Uh, no, ma'am. I certainly didn't. I was a pretty average student and uh, uh, didn't really uh, have the motivation to work probably as hard as I should have. Well, how do you account for the fact that you did not have the proper motivation in high school and yet you were able to go to the top in education? Well, I think uh, one of the best things that happened for me, uh, Clara, was to uh, go from high school to into the Navy. And in the Navy, I think I picked up uh, a lot of the things about motivation that caused me to want to be better and until a person kind of catches on to the idea that they must have this drive for excellence, I'm just not really sure they're going to be motivated to do the proper things. And once I received that, I was determined then that I was going to come back and get a good college education and continue that education until I had it uh, enough that I could do the kinds of things with my career that I wanted to do. 1961 must have been an outstanding year for you because that was the year that you marched down the aisles at what university? At East Central University in Ada, Oklahoma. And you received what kind of degree? I received a Bachelor of Science degree uh, with a major in industrial education and a minor in mathematics. But 1965 was a year because that was the year of the red and white. And tell me what happened to you in 1965. Well, in 1965, I was working for a large architect firm in Oklahoma City and wanted to attend school and get my master's degree, and the opportunity I had to do that was at the University of Oklahoma at Norman. And so I commuted from Oklahoma City and completed that degree uh, in 1965. Certainly, East college, a college that has an East somewhere, certainly appeals to you because I understand that you went to East Texas State. That's in Commerce, Texas, isn't it? That's right. Tell me what happened to you at East Texas State. Well, at East Texas State at that point in my life, I was of the age that I realized pretty much what I wanted to do, and I, I realized that to go on and provide leadership in higher education that I, I must have a uh, the doctorate degree, and so I went back to East Texas State because they had a tremendous program in two-year institutions and concentrated on uh, curriculum much like that that's offered at our institution here in Oklahoma City. So I received a specialist degree, more or less, in two-year uh, higher education institutions. All right. It must have been a happy day, though, when you became the first when you became president of the Seward Junior College in Liberal, Kansas? Well, it certainly did, because that's what I had dreamed of, uh, being the president of an institution, a uh, two-year institution that I had concentrated on, and uh, was able to go there with like 10 years of experience in my background, in addition to having that degree, uh, having served as a faculty member in the two years college, having served in director uh, of admissions and and registrar, and then uh, a dean of an instructional area. So I had done the kinds of jobs that uh, led to uh, getting that job as president. So it was probably uh, the highest point in my career. Okay, where is liberal Kansas in relationship to Wichita? 
Liberal Kansas is out in southwestern Kansas. If you know much about the panhandle of Oklahoma, uh, Liberal Kansas is only three miles from the Oklahoma line, and I had uh, somewhat joked that although I'd grown up in Oklahoma and left, uh, I had been to New Mexico, Texas, and Kansas and was kind of dreading Arkansas. I, so I had stayed rather close to Oklahoma, and in Liberal Kansas I was three miles away, probably closest to Guyman and Turpin and some towns like that in Oklahoma. This is the Clara Luper Radio Show, and I'm talking to Dr. Hooper. This program today is being made possible by your optometrist, Dr. A. L. Dow. If you are having any kind of trouble with your eyes, don't worry. Go to Dr. A. L. Dow. Dr. Dow's office is located at 934 Northeast 8th Street here in Oklahoma City, Oklahoma. Talking to Dr. Hooper. One thing about talking to people that have achieved, it gives other people a reason to go on. Because here's an average student in high school who went to college and made, went up to the top with a doctor's degree, and now he's president of a university that I want you to know about. Dr. Hooper? Doctor? Yes. I want to know now, you are the president of Oklahoma Technical, Oklahoma State Technical University? Mm-hmm. Okay, now that really sounds good. But I'm from Hoffman, Oklahoma. Would you break it down so that I can understand what that means? Okay. Uh, the Technical Branch Campus, uh, as a part of Oklahoma State University here in Oklahoma City, was started uh, back in uh, the early 60s as a branch campus to offer uh, two years of college work for the students that wanted to get a, a major in a very technical kind of area, such as engineering graphics, uh, architecture at that time, uh, heating, air conditioning, ventilation, uh, electronics, some of the specialties that would cause that person to be able to go to work probably primarily here in the metropolitan area because at that time, as you would remember, Clara, there was no uh, voc tech system in Oklahoma. There was not the two community colleges that you're aware of at Rose State and Oklahoma City Community College. So at that point in time, this institution was the only one where you could go and attend two years and come out with an associate degree with a specialty in a lot of these areas. Uh, at this point, we have some 26 programs that a student can acquire an associate degree. Okay, now let's go back. How many programs did you have to start with? Well, we started with three programs and 91 students. Okay, in, in just a minute now, Doctor. You're taking me to a little phase. Okay. You started in the 60s with three programs and how many students? 91 students. And how many teachers? Well, we had probably about three teachers. Three teachers, school. three programs, right. and 91 students. Right. And how, one of the things that happened at that point, Clara, that caused all that to happen, Oklahoma City University was dropping some of these programs, and the Chamber of Commerce in Oklahoma City became very concerned that people would not be trained for these special trades in Oklahoma City. And so they got very involved and talked to the Dean of Engineering at Oklahoma State University, and his uh, response was, sure, we can offer those programs in Oklahoma City. And they were just sort of offered as an off-campus offering. And, and classes started at the old Whittier School on 10th and, at 10th and Kentucky in Oklahoma City in 1961 with 91 students and uh, about three faculty members. Okay, how many students do you have today? We have almost 4,000 students. You have almost what? Almost 4,000 students today enrolled in 26 uh, technologies. Wonderful. Name some of, just a few of those technologies okay. for me. Uh, our, one of our largest programs and, and, and uh, super programs uh, is nursing, for example. There's a tremendous shortage of nurses right now in Oklahoma City metropolitan area, and in fact, all over the country. But that program has close to 600 students enrolled in, uh, in pre-nursing and nursing. So that program 
uh, is one of the better ones. But we have things like electronics. We probably have almost a thousand students enrolled in computer science. Um, we have uh, electronics, uh, drafting, architecture, uh, the types of programs that uh, you would expect in the technologies. And in the human services area, in addition to nursing, we have things like police and fire training science, and those are probably the only uh, programs like that uh, almost in Oklahoma. So we also have some very special programs. As we look at the universities, we are extremely interested in the growth of the universities, and I must compliment you. We also are interested in a number of minorities that are involved in the universities. So I would like, let me ask you first, how many full-time faculty members do you have? We only have about 53 uh, to 55 full-time faculty members, and that's one of the advantages of being in the metropolitan area where you can hire so many part-time uh, adjunct faculty that have good preparation in their areas of specialty. So we only have about 55 full-time faculty members. How many part-time faculty members? About three times that many. We have probably in the neighborhood of 150 part-time faculty members. So that would put you up a total number of how many? About uh, 200 or so. Okay, how many full-time black faculty members do you have? We have, uh, off the top of my head, and I don't have these numbers in front of me, but I know that we have... Uh, Sim Swindle, who's an associate professor. Was Who? Sim Swindle was an associate professor in police science, and one of our real strong uh, people is Faye May. Faye is uh, an associate director of probably the best nursing program in Oklahoma, and Faye is just an outstanding person and, and very well respected by our faculty. Uh, also, in that division, we had a black faculty member, Barbara Statham, that passed away about a year ago that uh, we were all very uh, uh, hurt by and we'll sorely miss this lady because she was just not only a class person but uh, an extremely strong faculty member in nursing. Um, and in our, in our efforts to hire minority faculty, we have, we have been able to hire a few. We just hired uh, a full-time uh, male uh, Native American in nursing, and he, uh, he resigned to go to, to Louisiana then. These people are very much in demand, and people okay. recruit them actively. Well, Doctor, you're taking me, you're taking me a little fast. Okay. Make, I want to make sure that I understand you have how many full-time black faculty members? I have at this point. Right off the top of my head, Claire, I'm going to say two full-time faculty members. There. Out of 185? Oh. Well, no, they're out of... Okay. I don't know how many part-time faculty members that we have are black because I don't have those numbers in front of me, but uh, we, I do know that we have some. Okay, as we are studying and looking at institutions, especially in our own state, and we've been required by our national office to file a report, and one of the things that we need to know, and I wish you would furnish me with that information as to the number of part-time black oh, faculty yeah, members that, that you yeah. have. Okay, now when Barbara died, was she replaced by a minority? Uh, no, well, she was. She was replaced by this uh, Native American uh, doc with a doctorate. Uh, and he was, I guess... Uh, I guess I uh, should say he was probably recruited and hired uh, to, in Louisiana. So he is no longer with us, but we actively pursue that. And, and uh, I would have to get back and just take a look at those numbers to tell you for sure. Okay, so when you speak of Native Americans, you're speaking of Indians, American is that Indians, correct? That's right. Okay, how many black administrators do you have? We have... Uh, the one I just talked about, who is associate director of the nursing program, uh, Faye May is a full-time uh, administrator and a very good one. Uh, we have a lady who is an administrator in financial aid. She's uh, really a staff person. She's not on the faculty, but she was hired to assist uh, students with their financial aid program and is an extremely uh, competent individual. And... Uh, oh. 
I can't think of any others. Okay. How many blacks do you have on your instructional council? Is that what you have in these colleges? Well, what we have, we have all the different committees and structure of a regular organization. People like uh, Faye May, of course, comes to mind, first of all. But they are, they are uh, requested to, to identify what committees on campus, what kind of advisory committees on campus that they want to be on, and then we try to respond to that. So everyone is, uh, is just chosen the same way. We try to pick them for those kind of uh, jobs uh, based on their best interest. And uh, if Faye May said she would want to be on instructional council or whatever, or whatever committee she wanted to be on, uh, she probably could be. So that's an open, very democratic uh, process. How about the other black? What was his name that you told uh, me about? Sam Swindle. It'd, okay. It'd be the same thing. Sam has uh, been w on our faculty for a number of years, and his tenured uh, was hitting up the police science program at one time, and he's now teaching uh, and is an associate professor in sociology. But he would be sent the questionnaire and ask him what committees that he'd like to serve on and so forth, and then he would probably be uh, placed on those committees. So that's a pretty open Well, program. Doctor, he was once head of a department and now he's associate he, professor? He, he requested to be uh, just... Uh, placed on the faculty as a, an associate professor in, I believe, uh, Sim is teaching sociology. Well, that's unusual. Usually people want to be heads of departments. Well, I think sometimes that's true, and then the, there are other reasons for them wanting to just simply maybe go back to the classroom and not have administrative responsibilities. So you have the, the entire uh, range of that activity. Okay, how many black divisional heads do you have now? Well, that would mean uh, that we have one, as I'm talking And that's Miss May? That's Faye May, uh-huh. Okay, do you have any black counselors? Uh, let's see. We have one that, of course, is a counselor, and that would be the young lady I referred to in, uh, in financial aid. Those people are considered counselors because they spend many, many hours with students in terms of financial uh, advisement and that kind of uh, counseling. I notice as I travel across the country, there are many universities. Enrollment has grown since I came, about 41 percent. Uh, this young lady worked with those groups very well, and then uh, the Internal Revenue Service came and stole her from us, and she moved to California, and we've lost her. We have not replaced her uh, with a minority person because we just interviewed and opened that process up. We would like to. I think... Uh, People like Teresa that works with them in financial aid makes a lot of difference. We have not hired a black and said, go recruit, go recruit blacks. We haven't done that uh, deliberately like that. But uh, I, as you indicate, I know a lot of schools in the country have done that. Okay, now, as far as your secretaries, do you have black secretaries and janitors and cafeteria workers? Yes, we certainly do. You have black secretaries? Right. Black we custodians? Do. We have a lot of. Well, as, as part of a group that came in on affirmative action about six months ago, uh, and a black person was on that, and he looked at me at the end of our interview and looked at some of our numbers, and at that point in time, uh, we had a very high percentage of uh, minority students on our campus, and he indicated to me at that time that we had almost as many as they had on the Stillwater campus. Now. Those numbers, as I remember them, Clara, are something in the range of six, like 600 to 900 difference. And uh, so we have, uh, we have a lot of, of minority students, and most of our minority students are black, although some of them are Native American, as you would uh, understand. Okay, now what are your plans for the future as it relates first to your university and then as it relates to black employment? Well, we have, uh, we have a very extensive uh, long-range planning process on our campus, and it has worked uh, for the last four years uh, uh, beautiful. We have been able to have all of our people on campus. Everyone on campus is on some kind of a committee uh, involved in long-range planning, and they have set out about 100, a little over 100, recommendations for the future of the institution and said these are our priorities and these are the things that we ought to be doing 
as you might understand, many of them would require a great deal of money. For example, we are in the process at this time in a building project to build a new learning resources center. Uh, in that facility, we'll be able to, for the first time, have a library facility on campus, and this is one of our real important thrust right at this point. Um, all of the other kinds of priorities that you might get involved in, and those hundred and something recommendations, have been presented by uh, uh, the people on our campus, and that's been everyone. In fact, Faye May is on this long-range uh, strategic steering committee, which is one of the most important positions on campus, and Faye uh, has been uh, uh, an extremely uh, important person to that process. In other words, she is a person that's very experienced. She's a person that understands our campus. She knows uh, the black student and knows them well and knows how to react to that. And in that process, we have come up with some extremely, uh, uh, I think, appropriate uh, long-range plans. Okay, you will share those with us at various times because sure. we would like to welcome you to the Clara Looper Radio Show. How do you get on that institutional council? Well, I, I'm not sure which council that you're referring to. There's, uh, there's a, everything from an administrative council Administrative Council is probably the key uh, group that you're talking about. The Administrative Council has a representative on there from everything, including the Evening College Director. It has the uh, faculty represented. It has staff represented, which would be the secretaries and uh, the financial aid advisor I was talking about. Uh, it would have uh, secretaries uh, involved in that group. It has a student representative on there. So each year, the administrative council is a, a group of people made up by those selected by the different groups on campus. And they are the ones that really make recommendations to me about the administration of the institution. Okay. You've been very kind to take out from your busy schedule to acquaint us with Oklahoma State University's Technica Branch, located at 900 North Portland. I do hope that in your future that we will have more blacks involved, and certainly if anyone would like to apply for a job, are they free to come out and apply? Oh, sure. Okay, I would like to get on that administrative staff. I'm telling you, if I had not retired from teaching, I'd put in my application in the morning. I would like to sit in one of those offices and uh, help to administrate well, Oklahoma State University. Well, it's exciting. It's an exciting place. Our enrollment's grown uh, in the last four years about 30%, and we've got a lot of exciting, well-qualified students on our campus, and uh, we're excited about the things we're doing, and we're making a a great contribution in Oklahoma City by a lot of the things that we get involved in, like the Oklahoma City Tree Bank Foundation and the, and the Harn Homestead Foundation, and many of our people are getting involved in the community, and it's exciting, and an exciting place to be at this particular time. Well, we want you involved in the minority community. I think I've sent you a letter concerning the Soul Bazaar and Ms. Blake the building of a monument to blacks. We want to see your face okay. in the black community. Okay. We need some integration over here, Dr. <laughs> Hooper. Okay. And we'll be out to the university to see you, and okay. you've been very kind. One good. question I want to ask you. Okay. Where did you meet your wife? My wife was my girlfriend uh, in the fifth grade. Doctor, I want to restate my question. Where did you meet her? In the fifth grade? In the fifth grade in Cement, Oklahoma. And you're still in love with her? Yes, sir. Yes, ma'am. Okay. Thank you for very kind. Goodbye, bye. Bye bye. That doctor talked about everything with confidence until I asked him about his wife. <laughs> thank you so very kindly. This is the Clara Looper Radio Show. And certainly we will bring you the best. You have been calling me about Tinkerfield's credit union. I'll tell you all about that because I know you want to know, so stay tuned to the Clara Luper Radio Show. Sir Charles Attell is located at 6225 Southeast 15th Street. If you, you deserve, you deserve a new 
suit, made to suit you. And therefore, if I want you to go to Sir Charles Taylor, 6225 Southeast 15th Street, here in Oklahoma City, Oklahoma. Speaking of places to go, if you need some real estate, call Mr. Carl Carbon. 4278311. All over town, you see the name, Carl Carbon. Call 4278311 for your real estate. Tipper and Son, ready to serve you. 2801 North Kelly, Rothfield Home, here in Oklahoma City, Oklahoma. If you're looking for the, a designer's haircut, or just a plain haircut, or any kind of haircut, be sure and see Mr. Gates at Gates Barbershop. Mr. Gates probably cut more heads than anybody. And when I say cut heads, uh, hair. oh, I'm sorry, Letty has me. He cuts hair off of heads. Now, do I have it straight, Letty? Mr. Robert Gates will give you the kind of haircut that you will always remember. I made that No, I say he cut heads. And I don't know why I say that. He doesn't cut heads. He cuts hair. He is, I don't know anybody ever gotten a cut. But some weeks ago, I told you about a young man who was on his way to participate in Star Search. On the telephone now, I have his lovely mother. How are you today? I'm fine. How are you doing? Okay, I want you to tell me about Christopher Eason. Okay, uh, right now we just got back from Italy last week. You just got back from Italy? Uh-huh. He performed on a show that was, it was a talent show for all the Italian children, but he was just a guest singer from the United States. Just and a minute now. You're taking me a little fast. Let me go back and back up my story. Is this the same young man that we saw in 1987 and got to sing up the free, uh, NACP Youth Council's office every Monday night? Yes, it is. Is this the same young man that appeared on the Miss Black Oklahoma City pageant? Yes. And went on to the Miss Black Oklahoma State televised pageant? Right. Is this the young man that tried out for Soul Search? Star Search, yes. Yeah, it's not Soul Search, it's, search, it's Star Search. Tell me about his first appearance his as first far as trying to qualify for Star Search. Okay, his first appearance, he had a uh, uh, audition at Fort Worth. I thought it was Midway City where he started. No, uh, well, his first, the first thing he did, he entered a, a contest. Uh, Search for the Stars in Oklahoma, in Dale City, okay. in 88. Okay. And from that, the winners, the finalists, take, were sent to Star Search. Okay. And a year later, I was contacted by Star Search for him to do an audition in Fort Worth, Texas. And he did his audition in May of this year. And the next day, I got a call from Star Search, and they were very impressed with Christopher and told him that he had made it on their show. And since then, things have just been moving quite fast for him. He went to Hollywood, and he won again, didn't he? He won five times on Star Search. Okay, he won five times on Star Search. Now, that would be shown when in Oklahoma? It will start to air in February. Okay. He won five times. Now, when does he go back to Star Search? He goes back for the semifinal uh, in two days. We leave on Tuesday. Okay, you just got back from Italy, and now you're leaving again, going back to Star Search. Right. Oh, that's exciting. Where now? In Hollywood? In Hollywood. Okay, you will be in Hollywood, California. Yes, and this time, how many tucks does he need? This time, he will need four. Four. For each episode. You always have to have one just in case something happens to the other zipper breaks or something like that, he'll need four. And before he needed how many? Before he needed six. Six, and he had those six, right? Yes, he did. And I know you would like to thank Mrs. Ford and other people at the NACP. Yes, I'd for... like to thank Mrs. Ford and Mrs. Fowler and Mrs. Hunter and also Marilyn and everybody that helped Christopher and also the NAACP, everybody that had anything to do with Christopher making it, uh, get, helping us make our trip a more pleasant trip. I just want to thank everybody for everything that they did. Well, certainly it was an honor. Uh, everybody was real proud of what they 
did. And since you'll be leaving in two days, you won't be here for Monday night, and we're going to really miss you. Now, is it true that your son is only 12 years old? Yes, he's only 12. Is it true that he has not been able to sing at his school? That's correct. Is it true that there was a black music teacher out there who refused to let him sing? That's right. And what did that black music teacher say to him? He just, well, he never really gave me an answer, a direct answer as to why Christopher couldn't sing at the school. He said he had to wait until he was in fifth grade. Well, he's now a sixth grader. Okay, now what is that teacher's name? Do you remember? I think he deserves. His name is Mr. Hankins. Mr. Hankins refused to let Chris Eason saying, and Chris has just returned from Rome, Italy, where he was flown over there along with his mother and was paid to sing just one song. Yes. And he couldn't sing in his school. That's right. It's been a pleasure to be with you, and may God bless you as you continue. All okay. Right. Bye-bye. Thank you. Bye. Mm -hmm. This program is being made possible by Cash Land Check Cashing, located at 1945 Northeast 23rd Street here in Oklahoma City. The telephone number is 424-1282. You can get your ca checks cashed. All you have to do now is to go down to Cash Land Check Cashing and get your checks cashed. Exotic Plants and Floors, located at 3671 North Everett Street. Mrs. Sylvia Bennett is the manager. Is open. It's a full line floors with wire, flowers. And if you're talking about flowers for funerals or weddings or anniversaries or birthdays, remember it's exotic plants and floors. Every day is Sweetheart Day, and they will send, they will send, something very special to you and you'll be able to get the roses that you need. You can get a rose for a dollar and fifty cents. They are open 9 a.m. to 6, Monday through Friday. And today they are open from 9 a.m. to 6, from 9 a.m. to 6 p.m. Go down and you can also buy some tropical fish. Now it's time for our sports. Yes, this is Shelly with your executive reporter with <clears throat> the basketball scores from Friday. And in girls basketball, Putnam North defeated Lawton 57 to 33. Northeast was defeated by Star Spencer 57 to 39. John Marshall beat Northwest 47 to 34. Millwood Trumbull Just a minute, Shelly. You say John Marshall beat Northwest? Yes, in girls basketball okay. 47 to 34. Okay. Okay. And Millwood Trumple Southeast 71-33, Midwest City over Edmond 52-38. And in boys, Putnam North over Lawton 67-54, Edmond over Midwest City 82-75, Dell City defeated McAllister 71-52, Star Spitzer over Northeast 70-56, Millwood defeated Southeast 60-48, Northwest defeated John Marshall 61-59, Norman over Putnam West, 73-46. And those are the high school basketball scores. Okay, tonight is a big game in Stillwater between Midwest City and Edmond. Who do you think will win it? Between Tulsa, Washington and Edmond. Oh, yeah. I just wanted to see if my executive sports announcer was ready. Yes, I believe Tulsa, Washington will win. Okay, well, thank you, Shelley. Okay, bye-bye. Okay, right, that was Shelley with her report, and that was made possible by Marilyn Hildred, your Allstate insurance agent. If it's insurance, call Marilyn. Call her at home, 427-8399, and tell her you want some insurance. Speaking of Tinker Credit Union, as a member of that credit union, I went out because you, the people, called me and asked me some questions. And as I went out to the credit union, I remembered a book that I had read by John Kennedy. It was called Profiles of Courage. In that book, he described the courage of men that made decisions in order that things could change at the price of their own advancement. And as I read the minutes of Tico Credit Union, I thought about the courage that it takes to stand up for what you know is right. I had, I had asked and requested, and you can do the same thing, to read minutes if you are a member of the Tinker Credit Union. And next Saturday, I will give you the names of some people that 
I didn't feel. Now, this is my private business, had the courage to stand at a time they needed to stand. When Mrs. Moore, the chairman of the Tinker Credit Union Board, was here, she stated in June that there was a 6-6 vote. However, she did not state that there were two other occasions in which the votes were tied 3-3. Now, this was concerning the breaking of the Code of Ethics, and the question was simple. Do you believe that a person who breaks the Code of Ethics should remain on the board of directors, on the board of directors for a credit union? Well, they were tied 3-3. Three, three. Twice. Now, not once, but twice. And I know you want to know who voted to keep a man that had broken the code of ethics. I know you want to know, and certainly you can find out like I did, and certainly if you pressure, pressure me, I'll sure tell you, and next week I will tell you. Now, three, just think of the seriousness of this. Three voted that it was all right to break the code of ethics, the code of ethics that had been established by the Tinker Credit Union. And three votes that it was right. Now, you had three votes that it was right to keep and three votes that it was wrong. If there, and now this was taken twice. Someone, and I, if I have the wrong information, someone should call me and tell me that the minutes were wrong. I also read that another committee that I was not familiar with voted on the breaking of the Code of Ethics. And this committee, as I understood it, was a supervisory committee. To me, in order that we can get back to mutual respect, we must receive a commitment from the Credit Union Board of Directors. I think that the Board of Directors of Tinker Credit Union must explain at their annual meeting, which will be in March, before the election, they must explain that the code of ethics of that union had been broken, and they must be very specific and tell us who voted for it to be for the man that had broken the code to be kicked out and who did not. I have the names, and I will give you the names next week. I think this should be done because all shadows of doubt, all shadows of distrust must be eliminated before we can go into a heartwarming, sincere meeting at the March meeting. I would also like to know, and I think you should know the public, the role of the supervisory committee and the board of directors and how they voted on this code of ethics that was, and maybe it was a slip of the lip. But sometimes the slip of the lip can cause a tip for those people that are involved. Now, according to what I understand, now this is my understanding, just to mine, the voters should receive Letters declaring that the policy, the voting policy, are changing. Or will the voters be told or sent letters on the changes of the voting policy 30 days before the annual meeting in March? Now, your report is going to keep you informed because you, the public, really need to know. And I'm going to keep you informed. A commitment then, once again, a commitment from the Credit Union Board of Directors of the Tinker Credit Union, in which they will explain at the annual meeting before the election, now notice I say before the election, they should explain to their constituents the, how the code of ethics was broken and who voted which way. The three voted one way and the three voted the other way. They owe that to you. Clara Luper. This is Onita. Yes. Okay. Okay. Uh, Rob Funeral Home announces the following services. Services for Mr. Merrick Thomas uh, will be this evening at 3 p.m., and that will be at the Garden Oaks Church of Christ at uh, 34 Northeast 16th. Funeral service for Mrs. Bueller Fields of 907 East Drive will be Thursday at 11 a.m. at the Shiloh Baptist Church. Uh, Rob Funeral Home announces the services of Mr. Alonzo J. Kelly Sr. Uh, is pending with the Rob Funeral Home. Funeral service for Mrs. Bessie A. Jones, 1810 North Jersey, 
is also pending with the Roth Funeral Home. Funeral service for Mrs. Lily May Combs of 424 Southwest 12th is also pending with the Roth Funeral Home. Services for Mr. Arthur I. Crockett of 2320 East Madison is also pending with the Roth Funeral Home. Temple Funeral Home announces the services of Mrs. Catherine Hines of 2639 Northwest 86th Place. Will be Monday at 10 a.m. That's in the chapel of the Temple Funeral Home. Funeral service for Mrs. Irene Bradshaw of 1215 Northeast 34th will be Monday at 1 p.m. That one will also be in the chapel of the Temple Funeral Home. We would like to say to the family this evening, be not dismayed, whatever betides you. Depend on God, and God will take care of you. And back to Clara. Well, thank you, Onita. Onita, so efficient. I don't know how to say thanks. Mr. V's Grocery is located at 50th and Martin Luther King Avenue, 5029 North Martin Luther King Avenue. You can go in there and you can get any kind of groceries you want. Not only that, they serve food, and that food is delicious. Open 7 a.m. to 9.30 p.m., and if you want some chitterlings that are delicious, go by there and buy some chitterlings. We have a problem, and I think the parents in Oklahoma City can correct that problem. We have a 13-year-old boy that has been certified as an adult. During this holiday season, that young man should be thinking about what he was going to get for Christmas. That young man should have been thinking about having fun at school. It's a 17-year-old boy who is sentenced to life in prison for shooting of two men. That 17-year-old boy should have been getting ready for his junior and senior prom. That 17-year-old boy should have been in school. Now, what we want to say to our young people and to the parents, we've got to get rid of these guns. Where are these young people getting all of these guns? We've got to get rid of the guns. Put down your weapons, young men unless and young women, unless you want to find yourselves in some peculiar situation. Now, I appeal to you, and it's embarrassing what happened at Douglas High School last night as the young people were having a talent where they could demonstrate that talent. It's a disgrace. And maybe those of us that are in churches aren't doing what we are supposed to do. What's wrong? These are our kids. They come out of our Sunday school classes. And speaking of Sunday school classes, they come out of our classrooms. These are our young people, and we've got to take on our responsibility. The people that we are singing and preaching to are sometimes the people that don't need it. Rather, we might have to go out and find them. Now, if you parents out there know that your child is not in Sunday school, you should take your child to Sunday school. If you know your children aren't involved in NACP, you should take them. Wouldn't that be cheaper than getting them out of jail? I appeal to you. Now, I stated at Oklahoma Christian College that drugs are not a problem. The problem is the people that are using drugs, the people that are selling drugs. Drugs don't have legs. Why can't we tell our children that this money they are making is a temporary thing? We need to have something permanent. I appeal today to the parents and to the preachers. It's good to preach, and I'm not going to tell you what to preach, but somewhere down the line, we're going to have to preach to such an extent that our young people will put down their guns. Let's put down our guns. Let's move on toward the promised land. We regret to report the death of Lester Love, who was formerly with KPRW in Oklahoma City. And we also pray that Bernadette Kincaid will recover. She's at Baptist Hot Burning, Burn Center in critical condition. And for those of you that don't know Bernadette, Bernadette is the daughter of Mrs. Beatrice Carr, who lives at 1237 West Hefner. Let's pray for those people. As I look at the clock on the wall, I know Clara Loop is going to have to say goodbye. But I really hate to say goodbye to you because you are so sweet and you have been with me so long. I would like to say to you, before I leave, I want you to be careful this weekend. Don't break in anybody's houses. Don't steal any automobiles. 
Just say to yourself, I know I'm somebody because God made me and my somebodyness is not going to let me hurt or wound anyone. Until next Saturday, the same time, this is Clara Looper and Liddy Hunter saying to each one of you, what are you going to say, Liddy? We love you. We love you. And bye now. And I would like to thank my husband for fixing those fabulous Christmas trees. Bye-bye. <laughs> It's 3 o'clock and you're listening to KBYE Radio 890 AM in Oklahoma City. It's time now for the HELP program with your brother and mine, Reverend James Young. <laughs> 